Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV. This is actually, I guess, technically episode one. And yeah, it's, this is Friday, Freestyle Friday. And today is my birthday, even though you're seeing this a month afterwards. So earlier today, I went to Pedernales Vineyards and hung out with Julie Culkin, who's one of the co-founders and their current winemaker. So David, her brother, is the head winemaker, but uh, Joanna has been their winemaker for, for a few years now. So I got to hung, hang out with her, talk some wine. I actually said in that episode, that was episode one, but I realized that Freestyle Friday, which is what we're doing right now, is going to be this episode. So Freestyle Friday, and I probably explained it in episode zero, but if I didn't, basically this is the day I get to do fun stuff and different things or maybe a second review or maybe if I'm doing a bunch of interviews, which you're going to see in the next few episodes. I'll do Monday, Friday episodes, uh, interviews. So that's the really short version. So today's the birthday. And instead of going to a restaurant, because while the COVID infections around beginning of September, September 8th specifically, are going down in Bear County and Texas in general, my dad's 80 years old. So we're not exactly comfortable necessarily going into a restaurant to eat, especially where you can't sit outside. The weather's pretty crappy today anyway. So we didn't really make any reservations at a place that would be open today. Actually, the place would have gone to is not open today. So we're going to eat at home. And so the original plan for this episode was to do this. So do some get home. My dad said, you know, you really should do more food and wine pairings if you're we're going to rebrand everything. I said, well, I do talk about pairing food all the time with the wines, but I don't really ever do the actual pairing. So that's what this episode is about. And he's out there picking up the food right now. And I'm going to try to do as much of the wine stuff ahead of time. So then when we sit down and actually eat dinner, we're already ready to go. All right. So we're going to start with the pre-dinner cocktail. I like to do this most of the time. And since we're at the house and I'm not driving, though, if I was going out, either dad would drive or if I was out by myself, I would Uber anyway. So we're going to do a pre-dinner cocktail. I thought, why not do one of the most classic of cocktails? And by me saying that, you probably know what I'm doing. Um, you can't really see with this ingredient back here. That's sugar. So we have a spirit. We have bitters. We have an orange. And we have sugar. And we have ice. What is it? It's called an old-fashioned. Basically, I just described what a basic classic cocktail has to have, the four components. It needs to have a spirit. It needs to have a bittering component. And he has needs some type of sweetness, which is the sugar. Uh, the orange is a, a, an additional bittering component. And then water, in this case, ice. So let's kind of go through the history real quick. The old fashioned just needs a spirit. Now we associate it with whiskey now, but it could have been any spirit way, way back in the day. So they would do gin, rum, brandy, or whiskey, and they would do a sugar cube. We don't have any sugar cubes, so I'm not exactly being perfect, but sugar is all you need. And then you would mix it with water and they would have a house made bitters. Now, these were proprietary recipes and they were akin to what we now call a decanter bitters. It would be a carafe on the bar with a secret mix of spices and botanicals steeping in rum. The decanter would be topped up with the spirit and bittering agents along the way in an almost Solera like manner. Solera is what they basically use for sherry. It's just as you take something away, you top it off with new stuff. So that's why you can have these Soleras with 100-year-old wine in it. It would be like a little bit of 100-year-old wine at that point. It was those house-made bitters that were consumed in the Cotil cup of at Apothecaries. I don't know what that is right now. I'll try to find a picture for you. So way back in 1806, the May 6th issue of the Balance and Columbian Repository in Hudson, New York, they published a reader-submitted letter asking what a cocktail is. In the subsequent week's issue on May 13th, 1806, the editor responded stating that it was a potent concoction of spirits, bitters, water, and sugar. So that defines what a cocktail is. 
The editor also remarked that it was also referred to as a bitter sling. In 1833, J.E. Alexander's Transatlantic Sketches, Volume 2, notes that he encountered it in New York City. He described it as being gin, rum, or brandy, and including significant water, sugar, and bitters. He also mentioned nutmeg as a garnish, which would lead one to believe that he experienced what's originally the toddy. So by the 1860s, liqueurs and juices began to make their way into the cocktail, and the old-fashioned was a way patrons would order drinks without these additions. So what would happen is I would come into the bar and say, I want a cocktail made the old-fashioned way, not this newfangled liqueurs and juices. I want like just the old-fashioned stuff. So in Dave Wanderick's Imbibe book from 2007, he highlighted this cultural shift, and in an article published in the Chicago Tribune entitled The Democracy in Trouble from 1880, where the old-fashioned is mentioned as being made with whiskey and without the extras. The old-fashioned does appear in Jerry Thomas's 1887 Bartender's Guide, but does not, I'm sorry, does not appear in Jerry Thomas's 1887 Bartender's Guide, but does appear in Boothby's The World's Drinks and How to Mix Them in 1908. So these are old books that are tend to be used, especially by mixologists and people who are trying to come up with these pre-prohibition and classic cocktails as to what the original recipes were for a lot of these cocktails. Uh, there's no mention of spirit, but only the brand that the patron requests. So, you know, if you want a gin, a rum, a brandy, uh, whiskey, whatever, and the brand. And that while Boker's Bitters was his preference, Angostura, which is what we all know and love, was a good substitute. It's important to note that the addition of water came from an understanding of how to properly enjoy spirit in a more balanced cocktail. So remember, this is balanced, so you need to balance everything together. And that's why when you go to a bar and you go, make it strong, make give me a strong island, bro, you are getting an unbalanced cocktail. And the bartender is actually just going to hate you anyway. And then from a time before refrigeration, so similarly, the toddy wasn't originally hot. It was a room temperature drink. It was a spice combination of spirit and sugar dissolved in water. So the preparation. Uh, today we find the return of the classic uh, with the old-fashioned being made with rum, mezcal, bourbon, or any of the spirit, and containing sugar bitters and water ice melt. The citrus peel garnish is a recent advent that can be considered part of the bittering ingredient it's important to remember that this cocktail went through a series, uh, through, a, through a serious evolution. The version including muddled maraschino cherries, orange wedges, and ginger ale in a snifter surfaced in the 1930s. After a rumored publishing error in a popular cocktail book skipped a page and included another cocktail's garnish under the old-fashioned recipe. Whether this is a true story or not, this variation was popular through most of the 20th century it may be considered a delinquent now, but your guests, this is actually, I got this from the Guild Psalm page. So your guests or you may order that version and it says you should prepare it happily. Um, I mean, if you are in a, one of these craft cocktail bars and they kind of look at you a little funny because you want all that other stuff, that's fine. Order it. If that's how you like your old fashioned. That's how you like old fashioned. If you go into the bar and you know it's like a, kind of that craft cocktail type of bar, you kind of say, hey, what's it a, a true old-fashioned like? And they're going to produce something like I'm going to produce here. All right, so what are we going to do? So I'm going to use a rye whiskey. So like, so use anything you want. Traditionally, you're going to use maybe a non-rye whiskey, a regular whiskey, American whiskey. I'm using Iowa Legendary Rye. Uh, this actually is, a, I think it's a fairly high proof, if I remember correctly. It is also 100% rye. It's normal proof, 80 proof. But when you get rye, a lot of times they're not 100% rye. They just need to be at least 51% rye. I've had this before straight. It's really, really, uh, it's, it is uh, really nice. So I've got my mixing glass. I already have some ice in here. It's starting to melt a little bit. So we're going to do two on this side because this side is one ounce each. Now you may say, Mark, why are you using a jigger? Well, I want to make this as perfectly as I can. Also, I haven't been practicing my my uh, liquor counts. So two for me would be an eight, an eight count. Uh, every half ounce is a one. 
And then we're going to do two, ta two dashes of bitters. So I have some Angostura bitters. Now, this stuff lasts forever. And the little plastic thing just came off. So I got two healthy dashes in there. And then one sugar cube. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my bar spoon. And I'm just going to kind of eyeball the amount of sugar I need. Now, so then it says add enough water to the sugar cube to dissolve with muddling. So we're not muddling with this and we're not doing any water necessarily. There's enough of a melt in here to do that. And then we add the spirits and the bitters with the ice. I'm going to stir it. You don't shake this one. All right, and then we're going to strain it. Get my Hawthorne strainer. That's what this strainer is, if you didn't know what that was called. And we're going to strain it into an old-fashioned glass with fresh ice. Okay, as you can't really see what I'm doing there. Then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to get a little bit of an orange peel. So you have... You can do it anyways, but this is, you know, basically a peeler. So I don't really do this very often. So this is the first time I've used the peeler. Oh, look at that. I got a nice little peel there. So we're going to twist it a little bit just to get the oils and then drop it in there. And then we're going to have this nice little drink here. First time I've actually made this at home. I don't make cocktails at home. I usually just drink stuff straight or that straight. So let's try it. That's super delicious. All right. So I'm going to sip on that while I talk about the wine. Okay. So first off, we have the Bonnet Ponson Champagne. This is a non-vintage champagne. It's, I purchased it for 60 bucks at High Street Wine Company. Several, several months ago, they had a champagne or sparkling wine class. And this was one of the wines they had. So this champagne house was founded in 1862 in a town called... Chamere with Gregory Bonnet as one of the first, what they call Recoltant Manipulant or RM uh, of that village. And what that means is that it's basically a small producer. It's someone who owns everything and they produce it. So instead of buying their fruit, they own all the fruit that they put into their champagne. Is it superior than buying the fruit? Not necessarily, but they have total control over everything. Uh, after him, Jules Bonnet extended the domain by purchasing more parcels in Chamray and installing a 5,500-kilogram 5, 5, wooden press powered by human strength before electricity reached the village around 1902. His son, Raoul, moved to another location in the village after the destruction of the family cellar by a, by a Second World War bombing. He then initiated the construction of their present caves to store his small production of about 5,000 bottles per year. Now realize... They make a lot more champagne per year now. Almost every champagne house is doing tens of thousands. Then joined by his son, Andre, who was in charge of plowing the family vines with his two horses at the age of 14. So you're 14 years old. You're on a farm. You're, you're working. 1956, Andre Bonnet met Monique Ponson, herself being from a wine grower's family of uh, Rigny, another village of the Montan de Rons area. So that's where this is at. They got married and started the domain uh, Bonnet Ponson. They started a few, they started with a few plots of Meunier. So you may have heard people say Pinot Meunier and Meunier is actually this, this kind of mutation of Pinot Noir, which Pinot, Pinot Noir is a, just mutates to everything. Pinot Noir, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris. They're all mutations of Pinot Noir, but Meunier is this kind of genetic equivalent mutation. So now they actually consider it a separate grape and they drop the Pinot officially, but everyone still says Pinot Meunier. Uh, and Pinot Noir and Chamray, Rigny, and uh, Coulomés in, uh, sorry, Coulomés La Montagne. They had, they added nine hectares and they planted it equally to Chardonnay, Meunier, and Pinot Noir. They dug new caves by themselves. They dug, you know, they dug these caves underground in Chamry's sandy ground in order to age their champagne longer. Their son, Thierry, joined the domain in 1979. Production was done with the family and three employees, including bottling and was called 
disgorge a la voile or the volley. And that is basically hand disgorgement. And they did 70,000 bottles per year on that. So I have a picture of what one of those machines looks like. It's not just like you take the, you take the crown cap off and there's a machine to do it, but it's done by hand instead of mechanically. Then Terry Bonnet continued the development of the domain with the construction of new caves and the addition of one more hectare of, of the vineyard, several new parcels in the villages of Chamry, Rigny, and Verzenay. Then he went to study enology and worked as a red wine maker in the southwest of France. Oh, I'm sorry, Cyril Bonnet did this and joined the family domain in 2013. Also in 2013, all of the vineyards began conversion to organic cultivation. So talk about the wine. It's 35% Pinot Noir, 35% Meunier, and 30% Chardonnay. 40% of the wine comes from what they call reserve wines. There's with perpetual blending, so from multiple vintages. And the terroir, the, the assemblage involves about 35 vine plots over the villages of Chamre, Rigny, Coulomb, La Montagne, in the western part of the Montagne de Ron. Our lights kind of go in and out. <laughs> um, the average... Average vine age is 35 years old. Various types of soils. Have, um, it has silicaceous, so silica, and calcareous soils with silty clay soil on chalky subsoil and calcareous clay soil with millstone fragments. That's a lot. It's just basically clay, calcium, and silica all mixed together. Vinification. So they do hand picking and they press the grapes within four hours of it getting to the winery. First, First fermentation in various containers. What they do is called it's called an inox. They call it stainless steel, they, but they call it inox in Europe. So 75% concrete tank in 20% and oak barrel 5% of that. Age on leaves for at least seven months before blending with the reserve wine. They do a partial mallow. So you don't really hear about mallow too much with champagne because you're trying to keep the acid as high as possible. But so mallow just takes the higher acid, brings it to a lower acid. So malic acid to lactic acid. And a lot of white wines will go through partial. Almost all red wines go through full mallow because that way it's not so, you know, bitterly acidic or bracingly acidic. No filtration, minimal use of sulfites. So it's under 40 milligrams per liter. So that's 40 ppm. It's aged in the bottle for four years and the dosage is, anywhere between eight to 10 grams per liter. So this is technically a brute. Brute is 12 grams per liter or less. It doesn't mean it's going to be sweet. It just means you're balancing the acid. So and I'll have a website link to that. Wine number two, you'll see I have a number on there. That was number, number three. So yesterday I went to tasting group. I brought all the wines. This is the one I brought. This is a badass wine. So this one is the 1990 Weingut Christophel Beres Erziger Wurzgarten Riesling Cabinet. I bought this off of Psalm Select at the end of last year for $39, um, which is a pretty incredible price for a 30-year-old wine. So it's a Grand Cru, or they call it Grossalaga, vineyard in the Erziger Wurzgarten. That means the Spice Garden of Erzig. And it's named the Spice Garden because they used to have a common practice of infusing herbs in wine in the 1600s. They have really, really steep, it's a really, really steep vineyard. If you saw some of my stuff from when I went to Germany last year, you'll see that. I should have some pictures coming up here. Um, you'll have an amphitheater-like vineyard, with, um, which is very common in the Mosul. And it has a unique rust-hued slate soil. So it's called red slate. You have red slate and blue slate in the Mosul, but in this case, it's red slate. So it's a little oxidized. Vines are own rooted which is actually somewhat unusual in the Mosul. And the reason is, if you leave it own rooted then you run the risk of phylloxera, which is a really bad louse that can infect the vines and kill them. So usually they use American rootstock, which is resistant to phylloxera, and then you don't really have to worry about it. Um, the vineyard's hand farmed because honestly, these slopes are too steep for mechanical farming anyway. And it only comes from really a couple acres of the actual larger vineyard Erziger, uh, Verts Garden. This was, Somslex said it was a specially allocated wine to Somslex, so you're probably not going to be able to find this specific wine anywhere. And I uh, already mentioned that. 
The winery is actually one of the oldest in the Mosul with documentation dating back to the mid-1500s. In 1997, the proprietor uh, Otto Christoffel retired and the property was left airless. So they're in this is directly from Psalm Select. Their impressive wine library in few precious acres of in the vineyards of Wurzgarten, uh, Trepechen, or sorry, Trepchen and Prelot, which if you watch my Dr. Lowson episode, we had some Prelot, uh, were taken over by their longtime neighbors and friends at Weingut Karl Erbis. So if you look on the if you look on the label, it's really hard to see because it's really small. It will say uh, Weingut. Uh, Christopher Erbis. And then the wine was fermented via ambient yeasts and matured in large neutral foudres uh, for about five years, which is a long time, and then bottled in 1996, and then it stayed in bottle from that point on until it got shipped to the United States. And it does have the original cork. So these are two really cool wines. The last thing we're going to talk about, because this is going to be my after-dinner drink. Now, I just had the Strega on here because I'm known for doing Strega, but or Strega, which means witch in Italian. But we're going to do some Frenet Branca. Now, I'm not a huge fan of Frenet Branca, but this is going to be my Digestif. So let's kind of talk about that real quick. So you can buy Frenet for about 26 bucks for this. We've literally had this in the house probably for 40 years. Um, and you can see how much has been drank, like none. So it still should be good because anyway, we're going to try it out. So a brand of Fernet. Uh, so Fernet Branca is a brand of Fernet, which is a style of Amaro originated in Italy. This is manufactured by Fratelli Branca and formulated in Milan in 1845. It's one of the best known of Italian bitters. Amaro is Italian for bitter and is an Italian herbal liqueur that is commonly consumed as an after dinner digestif. It usually has a bittersweet flavor, sometimes syrupy, and has an alcohol content anywhere between 16 and 40%. And this one is, I believe, 45%. So it's pretty, it's pretty hefty. Fernet is a more sharply bitter than other Amaros. And this is one of the most well-known examples, but there are other Fernets. You have Fernet Hunter, Fernet, uh, and Fernet Stock, Luxardo Fernet. Amaro, Santa Maria, Almonte, those are some other brands. I've only heard of maybe one of those, but there's lots of other brands out there. So it was made by a self-taught herbalist, uh, Bernardo Branca. It was marketed as a cure for cholera, stomach ache, and nervous disorder. So a lot of these things in the, in the early days of liqueurs and Amaros and things like that were used as medicines. Like Jaeger was, you know, a cough medicine. Now it's just you drink it, right? Uh, it was made from 27 herbs and other ingredients. The exact formula is a trade secret, just like Strega. And, you know, just like you hear Coca-Cola, only two people in the world know what the actual recipe is. So same thing here. Uh, it's only known to the Fernet Branca president, Nicolo Branca, who personally measures out the aromatics during the production process. So apparently he's the only one who knows. I guess if he dies, there's some envelope in a safe to reveal everything. It is known that the beverage contains aloe ferox, which is bitter aloe, uh, gentian, which is a bittering agent, chamomile, angelica, quinine, Chinese rhubarb, myrrh, peppermint, and saffron. And then the rest, we don't know, or maybe somebody else knows. Uh, it's, it has a higher ABV. So Wikipedia says 39%, but this is 45% and a lower sugar content than most other Amari. Uh, it's also one of the few Amaris to be aged in a barrel for one year. And it's typically served in a cordial glass or as a mixing component, usually supportive, and it's not the primary ingredient cocktails. Or if you're in the industry and you're done with your shift and you go to the bar next door, you just shoot it straight. You don't even like sip on it. So that is the lineup. And I didn't drink any of my old fashioned. That is the lineup. We're going to have some dinner. So we're going to stop the recording and I'm going to get set up and we're going to have some dinner. <clears throat> Okay, so first course is the champagne. Already kind of tasted it, really, really, really nice. But I like to do champagne with salad. Now, I don't know if every family does this, but we eat the salad and the entree at the same time. So I'm just gonna do the salad portion real quick and talk about the champagne. So right off the bat, we get the usual champagne stuff. This dad over here, you can see his hand eating his salad. <laughs> um, anyway. 
you got the typical like brioche and really lazy and um, toasty type of things going on here. Kind of that bakery, that cinnamon toast crunch, all that kind of good stuff. On the palate, again, I mean, this is, this is, I've never had a bad champagne. I'm not saying this tastes like, I'm not saying that all champagne tastes the same, but this has really good mouthfeel. So the bubbles are really nice and fine. You're getting some really great apple flavors. It's really, really crisp green apple. You get a little bit of lemon out of it, a little bit of lemon curd. You're getting, um, again, that, that bakery, that lazy type of stuff happening. And what I like about doing with salad Especially, we'll say like a creamy, this is like a creamy Italian. This is like their house dressing uh, over at Paisano's. Um, it can really cut through it. So for me, with salad, because salad has a, a lot of bitter components to it, especially if you don't put a really sweet dressing on it. This is not a sweet wine. It's got a little bit of sugar in it, like I already talked about, but it's really just to balance the acidity. So there's like a contrast with this. Now, with spinach, sometimes spinach can be a little sweet, especially like spinach salads. They'll put like pecans or sometimes nuts in there. The dressing may have, may have a little bit of sweetness. So that'll counteract the sparkling wine or champagne. But this is kind of like a bitterness and a little bit of a bitterness. It's a little bit of an enhancement of it. And... Because the salad has that greenness, I like that the champagne is enhancing all that. It's 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 my preference. You don't have to do it, but I like salad with with champagne. I also like the texture of it. So kind of like how champagne really works well with fried food because of the texture. I also think it works really good with leafy vegetables. There's a, there's an interplay with the bubbles and the texture of the greens in here that I, I really, 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 really like. Okay. So now I'm going to pour myself some of the other wine. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to chug this. All right, so I finished the champagne real quick because I didn't realize I needed a third glass. So I'm going to pour some of the other wine, and I'll be right back. All right, so now we switch to the Riesling. Now, Riesling is not my first choice to pair with Italian food, um, but the honest truth is I don't really have any Italian wines in the house. Well, I do, but they're not, I wouldn't call them like special Italian wines, whether they're red or white, to pair with the Italian food. And the goal of this entire dinner is to only use what I already had in the house. So I wasn't going out and buying anything for it. I mean, I did buy dessert, which I'll get to later. And I didn't talk about the dessert one I'm going to do. So I'll do that after we finish dinner. But whatever I have in the house is what I'm going to do. And I have a lot of wine, but the sad part is I don't really have any premium Italian wines. Now I have just a standard Pinot Grigio, which is fine, but this is a special night. I don't want just ordinary Pinot Grigio. And I bought a, um, a red wine that I've actually reviewed in the past. It's really good. But again, I wanted something a little bit more special. So this is, I brought this to tasting group yesterday and I tasted it. And I think knowing that we're going to have this most likely, I think it will go really well. So I've already tasted the wine yesterday, but I'm going to retaste it. Okay, this is take three. I told dad to go inside because he's, yeah. Anyway, he's he's making us laugh. So he's still laughing. So take three. So let's get into the wine. I've already tasted the wine yesterday. And so let's get into the nose. So you definitely can smell its age. It's a little musty. And that's normal for wines of this age. But there's a honeyed characteristic to it. You can smell like the old barrels, like you are literally like in this cellar in Germany and 
You can smell the barrels around you and you can smell the walls and you can smell, I know it sounds bad, but smell the mold and the mildew, but that's okay. It, it, but that's, and that's not that bad. It's not really that much in the wine, but you smell that little mustiness, but you smell that honey characteristic and you smell the age to any oxidation to it. And since I've been to Germany and I've been in cellars and you know, well, actually I didn't really go to any cellars in Germany, but I went to the wineries and these wineries are old. It reminds me of being back there. And then in Burgundy being in these old, old cellars and Bordeaux being in the old cellars. So it brought me back to being in places that are hundreds of years old, that have cellars that are hundreds of years old. So smell is one of the most powerful things for memory. And even though I didn't go into any cellars necessarily in Germany, it brought me back to my experience in Germany. There's apricot in it. There's a little nuttiness and that's from the oxidation. It's this kind of Riesling is what made me appreciate Riesling. Current release Riesling is awesome, but it's like, yeah, it's tasty. It's good. But you put some age on it, especially when you get to more than 10 years, get 20, 30 years of age. Outstanding stuff. So right off the bat, the acidity is there. When I first tasted it yesterday, it was kind of like, not that it was flat, but it was like, it's rich. So the richness is really being um, balanced by the acidity. There's, again, that honeyed characteristic. This is cabinet. Cabinet's the, the lowest level of ripeness. So you won't really have any botrytis in there. You won't get botrytis so you get to the, at least maybe spate laser, but really in the ouch laser and higher. And that gives you the shriveled grapes and really concentrated fruit. But the oxidation and all that, you get that really honey characteristic. The sugar is definitely there. It's only 7% alcohol, so it's a low alcohol wine. But the, the acid is there. The apricot is there. There's peach. The nuttiness is there. It's like a walnut. You've got that mustiness, that, that old part to it. It's really good. So why did I put it with this? The acid is going to pair really well with this Vilcristina. So Vilcristina is kind of a, a riff on veal piccata. Um, though it's a creamier sauce and it's a flour type of breading to the veal. And then we have some butter garlic with the pasta. And so the high acid of the wine, but the richest of the wine, I will stand up really to the sauce. So let's get into the Vilcristina. So this Vilcristina is available at Paisano's only in Lincoln Heights and it's off the menu. So actually dad said when we went to go pick it up, the person who gave it to him had never heard of it. So there's a great interplay of tartness, of lemon, of cream. The capers are in there and the breading. It's, it's an incredible one. Actually the champagne would be really good Dad just kicked the tripod, so sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, hey, we haven't done this in like probably eight years when I did a Christmas dinner with when mom was still alive and we had all three of us here. So the riches of this of this wine and the acidity is going great with this, with the veal. I mean, if Italians could make, and Italians can make Riesling, matter of fact, I, I haven't had any Italian reasons, but they could make Riesling, especially in the northern parts of Italy, because if it's cool enough, if they had a, a, a wine like this, which they, they do, but this would be a great pairing. You add that with the butter garlic of the pasta. It sings. This wine absolutely sings on its own. You put it with a rich dish like this, it'll stand up to it. When I was in Germany, we were eating steaks. We were having meat, like, like not steaks, but we were having schnitzels with Riesling. So this is one of those most versatile white wines. And like I said, aged Riesling is what really did it for me to go Riesling is incredible. Now, is it my favorite wine? No. But Age Riesling is definitely, I would, I haven't ranked it, but it might be my top five of wine, styles of wine. 
Italian red wines are probably my favorite, along with French. And then there's definitely some cool American wines. I mean, it's kind of hard to rank everything. It's like you're picking your favorite kid, but it is incredible stuff. We also have garlic bread uh, from Paisano. So they're famous for this bread. So again, more of that butter and garlic. You have these in-house rolls that they make. So the texture and all that is really going to go really well with this. This pairing is outstanding. If I was in a restaurant with the champagne I had would be at least 120 bucks. This in a restaurant list probably wouldn't be just 80 bucks. It would probably be a hundred or more. The meal is whatever it is, like 20 something dollars. I mean, we're talking just for me, but say two people, we're only sharing, we're sharing a you know, one bottle, one each. This is easily plus the dessert, plus the wine I'll use for dessert, plus the old fashioned that I made, plus the Fernet Branca, which I'm really the only one drinking, but let's say both of us are drinking. This is a $300 meal and it costs what? 66 bucks. 66 bucks for the food alone. Yeah. They charged us 50 cents per thing of bread. <laughs> so but they didn't, no. oh, they said they were. It's anyway. 33, 33 bucks a, a plate. Anyway, they told me on the phone that they charged 50 cents per bread. I, I was like, whatever, give me six pieces. So this is easily a $300 dinner plus plus, which means tax and gratuity. So I'm not saying that we wouldn't have gone out to dinner necessarily, but with COVID and my dad being 80 years old, and no really good places outside to eat in San Antonio, we felt the best thing to do was to eat here in the house. All right, so I'm gonna finish my dinner because now it's getting all cold and I'm gonna enjoy it and then I'll come back for some dessert and I'll talk about the Royal Tokai and why I chose that. So what's for dessert? Typically I do something chocolatey, but the dessert wines I have at home really aren't good wines to pair with chocolate. So I decided to do something a little bit lighter. So in San Antonio and a lot of places in South Texas and, and, and uh, Central, South, and North America, um, I went with a cake called the Tres Leches cake. So that translates to three milks cake. Um, it's a sponge cake and in some recipes a butter cake soaked in three kinds of milk. So you'll have evaporated milk, condensed milk, and heavy cream. Uh, the idea for creating a cake soaked in liquid is likely a medieval, uh, likely of medieval European origin, as similar cakes such as the British trifle and rum cake and tiramisu, which is something that if we were at Pisano's, I would have had, uh, and it's used used as this method. Uh, recipe for soak recipes for soak cake desserts were seen in Mexico's earliest 19th century, and a woman by the name of Patricia uh, Quintana who is a recognized international cook and expert in Mexican gastronomy, believes it came from uh, Sinaloa or Sinaloa, Mexico. And so in my research, I found that recipes have appeared on Nestle condensed milk can labels in the 1930s or 1960s. I guess there's some conflicting evidence on it, but there's evidence to show that both are correct, but they disagree on you know where it actually started. Uh, the cake became widely disseminated due to popularity throughout Latin America as Nestle uh, had created subsidiaries in Argentina, Chile, Cuba, Colombia, Mexico, Nicaragua, Peru, and Venezuela. And so, like I already mentioned, it's very popular in Central and South America, also North America, many parts of Caribbean, Canary Islands, uh, and believe it or not, Albania and North Macedonia, or the Republic of North Macedonia, uh, and some other parts of Europe. And I... I it's like everywhere here in San Antonio. I mean, it's part of the Mexican culture and you can't escape it. So what did I decide to pair with it? So I have a few different dessert wines and they're all of, of this type of wine here. And I decided to go with uh, one of my favorite styles of wine, which is a, which is a wine that's affected by botrycized grapes. So I have Sauterne and Sauterne's awesome, but I really do like Tokai. So I went with the 2013 Royal Tokai Company, Tokai uh, Asu, I think it's pronounced Asu, uh, Five Putonyush, 
Red Label. A lot to say there. Uh, bought it for 65 bucks at High Street Wine Company. You can find it for 50 to 60 some odd dollars, depending on where you're buying it at. And this was like the champagne was part of a class I did at High Street where they were doing a bunch of different desserts, dessert wines. So I really like, I really like Royal Tokai. And so I've already had this wine a year or two ago. So I've already had it in the past, but we're going to have it again because it's been a minute since I had some. So what's Tokai? It's the name of wines from the Tokai region of Hungary or the adjoining Tokai region of Slovakia. And this region is really noted for sweet wines and they're made from grapes affected by what's called Novorot or Botrytis. And that is a style of wine which has a long history in the region. And it's considered the nectar coming from the grapes of Tokai. And it's also mentioned in, believe it or not, the national anthem of Hungary. And so the Slovak wine region of Tokai also can use their version on the label, but they have to make sure they're adhering to the Hungarian quality control regulations. And this whole area used to be part of the greater, was called the Tokai Hegelaya, and I probably completely butchered that, region within the kingdom of Hungary, and then was divided between Hungary and Czechoslovakia after the Treaty of Trianon. The, uh, the grapes are grown on volcanic soil and at the fork of the rivers of Bodrog and uh, Hernad. And the meeting of the uh, Titsa and Bodrog rivers in Tokai create a mist, which is similar to that of the fog that's in Sautern. So they're both similar wines. This mist encourages what's called Botrytis cinerea, a cinerea or Novorot. And what it does is it dries out the grapes. It really shrivels them up. And what that does is it concentrates the sugars. And then the grapes that are infected with botrytis are commonly referred to by the Hungarian term azu. Now, when I went to Bordeaux in 2011, I went to the Sautern region and I got to see, not only see botrytis grapes, but I got to taste them over at Doisy for Dream, which is the Sautern that I have. And uh, it's really, 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 really interesting. So there are six grapes that can be used to make uh, this wine. The, the most famous is Furmint, or it looks like Furmint, but it's Furmint. Uh, Hars Levejlu, I completely butchered that. I sometimes can pronounce it right. I'll, the lower third will have it. Uh, a wine called, or sorry, a grape called Yellow Muscat. In Hungarian, it's Zarga Muscatoli. Uh, then you have Zeta, which was previously called Oremus, which is a cross of ferment in Bouvier grapes. And then you have Coverzolo and Kabar, which is a cross between Harsvelezu, oh no, Harsvelelu, Hars, Harslevelu, Harsve, Har, the lower third. I, I always mess up that name, and Bouvier grapes. So these are the six different grapes you can use. Furmint accounts for 6% of the area and is by far the most important of the grapes. And then the, the rest, 30% is the Pars Lavelu. I think I got it right this time. So there's multiple types of Tokai. I'll run over just the basics of it. You have dry wines and it's um, relatively new development. The wines were once referred to uh, as common or ordinarium. And they're now named after their respective grape varieties. Then you have uh, Zamorodny, which is a sweet wine. And it's about 100 to 120. What are you looking at? <laughs> Dad's like looking to see if he's on the, he's on camera. Not, you can't see him. He's looking at the, the, the plate being taken away. Just don't go too far down this way. Um, so anyway, so Zamorodny is 100 to 120 grams of residual sugar. So it's definitely a sweet wine, or they term it Erez. And uh, when the bunches contain less than, when the bunches contain less botrytis grape, the residual sugar content is much lower, resulting in what's known as Zaraz, or dry wine. And the alcohol content is typically, like, pretty high. I mean, 14% is a fairly high alcohol wine. Then you have Azu, which is what we're used to. And those are berries that are picked individually, then collected in huge vats and trampled into a consistency of paste known as azu dough. Then you have must or wine is poured onto the dough 
and left for 24 to 48 hours and they stirred occasionally. Then the wine is racked off into wooden casks or vats where fermentation is completed into uh, completed and then the Azu wine is matured. The casks are stored in a cool environment and are not tightly closed. So a slow fermentation process continues in the cask and usually takes several years. Now the concentration of the Azu was traditionally defined by the number of Boutonia of dough added to a gonk cask, which is a 136 liter barrel of must. Now the number is based upon the content of sugar and sugar-free extract in the mature wine. It, these range from three Boutonioche to six Boutonioche, uh, with a further category called Azu Essencia, representing wines above six. Unlike most other wines, alcohol content typically runs higher than 14%. And then annual production of Azu uh, is less than 1% of the regional's uh, total output. Then you have, so I talked about Essencia, also called Nectar, is also described as one of the most exclusive wines in the world, although technically it cannot be called a wine in a lot of places because it's, because the sugar content means its alcohol level never goes above five or six percent. The sugar concentration is typically between 500 and 700 grams per liter. And then in 2000, they produced one that was 900 grams per liter. So this is exceedingly sweet. And then unlike all, virtually all the wines, Essencia maintains its quality and drinkability when stored for 200 years or more. I don't know how they, well, they've been making this wine for hundreds of years, but I would like to have tried a 200 year old Essencia. And then they have other sweet wines. I won't go through all those. So, um, if you remember correctly from your history, Hungary was part of the behind the Iron Curtain. So after the collapse of communism, the Royal Tokai Company was founded in 1990 by a well-known author named Hugh Johnson. He's a wine author. And then he has a small group of investors that helped him with it. And they were inspired to restore and preserve Hungary's uh, precious wine legacy with Tokai. Now, of this, the five Petronius, the red label, there's only been 14 vintages since 1990. And I'll, I'll read them off real quick. So 91, 93, 95, 96, 99, 2000, 03, and then 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, then 13, and 16. So there's been one more after this, so 16. I don't know if it's on the market yet, but it, it's been made. And then this wine is a blend of carefully selected grapes from several of Royal Tokai's first and second growth vineyards. I won't go too far to that, but they created these first and second growth vineyards, kind of like Grand Cru, Premier Cru for them. The technical information on the wine. So it's using ferment, Pars Vallelu, and Muscat. The alcohol is 11%, um, unlike the other wines that can go higher. It's total acidity is 7.7 .7 grams per liter. So that's a pretty high acidity and that's not unusual. And it's residual sugar is 162 grams per liter. So it's sweet. It's not as sweet as some other resort wines, but it's definitely sweet. So let's get into the Tres Leches. That's like the cream. You know, this, these styles of cakes, like I already mentioned with like tiramisu and all that. You have this really, really creamy and really milky consistency. The, the place I got it from, they put some blueberries, blackberries, and strawberries on it. So you get some extra fruit in there. So we're going to try to get some blueberries in here. It's super sweet. It's really delicious. It's very moist. Now, let's get into the wine here. And one of the things you want to do with desserts is you want to try to match the sweetness levels with your dessert and the wine. So if I was going to drink champagne with this, if it's normal brut champagne, the champagne will come off really, really bitter and it won't really do well. If I drink something extremely sweet, it'll be okay, but it might overpower the sweetness of this. I don't know precisely the sweetness level of the dessert with the wine, but I've had the wine before and I was I was able to try some of this before we bought some and it should be pretty close. So on the nose, there's a waxiness. You have a really honey, honeycomb character. And that's, in this case, that's a Botrytis. Whereas when I talked about the Riesling, 
there was a hunting characteristic, but that level of ripeness from Riesling typically doesn't have botrytis. There's a saffron quality to it. Again, that's a botrytis characteristic. I don't necessarily getting ginger, but ginger is also another characteristic of botrytis on the nose. There's peach, apricot. There's a touch of nuttiness to it. There's going to be a little bit of oxidation. There is like a wax type of cap to the bottle, which let me go get the bottle. Okay, got the bottle. Now you can see the dessert too. And there's this wax covering on it. So it's not like really thick wax, like say a Maker's Mark or Bell Gloss or some of these wineries that put like a ton of wax on top. There's definitely some probably permeability to it, but you've got a regular cork and you've got the wax on there. So it will oxidize, but probably at a slower rate than other things. The other thing is this is a 500 milliliter bottle. So the smaller the bottle, the faster the oxidation. So the wax will help slow it down a little bit, but it's still probably going to oxidize a little bit faster than say a 750. Then when you get to like magnums, they oxidize slower. And just think about it. There's more, more stuff in there. The, the more wine you put in there, the slower the oxidation because there's, there's more wine to, to accept the, the same amount of oxygen getting through. Orange characteristics. Waxy, already talked about that. Let's just taste it. Very sweet. These are the wines that you drink, and unless you don't like sweet stuff, you're not going to turn this down. And it's orange, nectarine, peach, apricot, a little bit of fig. And these are all like extremely sweet on the ripeness levels on the fruit, very candied. The waxiness is still there. The saffron is still there. The honey characteristics there. There's a, a thick viscosity to it. And that's one of the things about the, the sugar is really, the sugar really, um, I mean, it, I don't know if you can tell when I'm swirling it, there's like a weight, a heaviness to it. It doesn't swirl so fast like wine and water swirls even faster because water has effectively a viscosity of zero. And then you add alcohol, alcohol adds to viscosity. Now viscosity, wine people like to call viscosity the, the tearing, but tearing is not viscosity. Viscosity is the thickness of liquid, not tearing. That's a different, that's a different phenomenon. And I won't go through all that right now. But you can see it, it moves slower. At least I can see it. I don't know if you really see it on camera, but it moves slower. There's also this somewhat bitterness of it. It's like having the orange peel and it's balanced with that sugar, the high acidity. It's delicious. So let's take a bite here. And it's just awesome. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to enjoy this dessert with my Tokai. And then I'll come back and we'll do some Fernet. And I'm going to call it a night because I got to be at a winery tomorrow morning. And so I can't be up too late and I can't be up drinking too much. And I pace myself really well. So I'm looking forward to going to that winery tomorrow. You'll see that interview in about a week, week and a half. And it'll be really cool because I haven't been there yet. I hear really good things about it. Go ahead, make sure you watch that interview because it's a, it's a, a one of the, well, I don't know how many collaborations or uh, cooperatives or collaborations there are in Texas, but hopefully I'll find out tomorrow. I'll try to remember to ask them about that. And uh, a friend of mine works there. So it'd be really cool to get to see him because I haven't seen him in forever. So yeah, I have another friend who probably by the time you see this isn't going to be there anymore, but. She has been working with them for a while and then she's kind of going to do her own thing here. So I don't know if I'll see her tomorrow there, but it'll be cool if I get to see both of them. All right. I'm going to eat my dessert. Okay. So it's the end of the end of the meal, end of dinner. 
as my Italian American brethren would say, the buffad, which I'm actually not buffad, but you're like really full, you're stuffed, and you need something to sell your stomach. So that's where Digistif comes in. Now, like I said earlier, I normally would just end with a strega on the rocks with a splash of water, and it's a little bit semi sweet. It's got some of the same characteristics as this with the saffron. Not only the honey, but it's got an anise flavor. It's really pleasant, especially if you cut it with some water. If you drink it straight, you can do it, but I prefer it with a little bit of water. But I figured let's stick with um, a proper type of meal and let's do some fernet. Now, one thing I want to backtrack real quick. So I corv in this and you can corv in, it has a regular cork in it, but because it's so thick, and sugary, I'm going to definitely need to clean out the needle. So rinse it out and clean it out as soon as I'm done with this. Don't let it sit overnight and get the get all crusty. It's kind of like, you know, when you use pour spouts with things like Bailey's and all that kind of stuff, it gets really nasty. So you have to clean those pour spouts. Same thing with the Coravin. Also, typically with dessert wines, you only will do, whether it's this style of wine or port or whatever, you usually only do about a half a glass, which is about what I did. So three ounce pour rather than six ounce pour. With sweet wines like this, it's not because of alcohol content, it's because of the sweetness level is so high. With port and sherries, or you know, after dinner, you know, wines like that, a lot of times because you have very high alcohol. So you're dealing with 17 to 20, 22 percent alcohol. So you're not quite two times a standard glass of wine, but depending on the wine you're drinking, you're pretty close to two times. All right, so let's get into the fernet. I already kind of gave you the history. And uh, like I said, this bottle is pretty old. So I'm going to give myself a standard two ounce pour. And I'm going to measure it. Woo! Now you typically use a cordial glass, which we so happen to have. It's kind of fancy. It's kind of got like this like rainbow effect on it. Oh, wow. There's probably like sediment because it's like. It's not pouring out anymore. Whoa, there we go. All right, that's plenty. I don't need a full two ounces. Now, this thing is probably going to have to get cleaned out too. Remember, it says like 45% alcohol. So this is a pretty strong, it's 90 proof. So this is not something, again, a two ounce pour is plenty hefty. So you can see it's really, really brown. I don't know how much you can see there, but it's really, really brown. I mean, it's also gold, not golden color, but the, the, the glass is tinting it a little bit. It's really thick and it's really meant to just kind of sell your stomach. Now, I, like I said, I'm not like stuffed, but that's mainly because we took like a two hour break. We finished dinner, watched some TV. I was like, I got to finish this. So let's do some dessert. And you know, dessert was good. And uh, I can already smell the aromatics. I already mentioned that Fernet is not my favorite when it comes to these things, but Let's do it because I've grown to appreciate it a little bit more over the years now that I understand what it is and my fellow Psalms really like it. And I admit most of them, they just, or not just Psalms, like people in the industry, they just, they, they shoot it like a shot. And like, that's not how you're supposed to drink this. You're supposed to sip it and savor it. So let's, I mean, it's already really aromatic, but let's kind of just delve into it. So. This aroma reminds me of an accordion case as dad heads out who plays accordion. So I use accordion case as a um, descriptor for a lot of Italian wines, especially Chianti. So there's this leather felt and dust. It's mostly dust in this case and kind of that leathery, but there's like this old type of smell to it. And this is an old bottle, but I can tell you it smells like it always smells like other friend out I've had that's obviously not as old as this bottle, you know, pretty much smells like that. You know, the, the label's in really good shape. I don't know if this is really that old of a bottle. I might have, somebody might have bought this more recently, but I mean, the label is like pristine, but then again, it wasn't really used much. I don't think I bought it, but who knows? Maybe I did, but there's like this 
syrupy kind of cough syrup type of aroma to it. It's not quite licorice, but there's also an earthy component to it, kind of a barky component to it, like, you know, like tree bark. That might be from the, the, the quinine because it comes from tree bark. There's also kind of a floral component. Like this is probably one of the first times I've actually sat down and really kind of analyzed Fernet or Fernet Branca specifically. Usually I'm just kind of like, okay, I'm just going to shoot it. I haven't really done a sipping on it. There's also a little bit of a savoriness to it. There's, like an oregano herbaceousness to it, a savoriness to it. A slight minty quality to it. I mean, it's a, I would say aromatically, it's an extremely complex thing. It should be. It's 27 different, but you know, herbs or spices and stuff. Like there's a lot going on there and I should be able to smell more than just one thing. So let's taste it. Whew. It is potent. On the potency alone, I don't know if I could finish this. Now, how about how does it taste? So it's kind of weird because it really hits you and it's definitely bitter. It's an Amaro. There's all these types of things. There's it was like a mint chocolate thing going on. There is, again, that accordion case. There's that really dusty and leathery and kind of fuzzy, felty thing going on. And then there's like literally biting into a tree bark. And there's... The savory herbs are in there. The spices are in there. There's a potpourri type of flavor to it. The dried flowers. Uh, whereas I think on the nose it was there was a floral, but this is like it's like dried flowers. There's also like this, I don't know if there's any Pier 1s anymore, but there's this like Pier 1 imports. So when you walk into one of those types of places that sell all these type of wicker furniture, like, like, like World Market. So Pier 1 predates World Market or cost plus World Market. So they have all these spices and things like that and all these wood aromas so you, it's like walking into one of those places and you get all that. It's also like walking into an antique shop. You smell all that old dusty wood and varnish and, and wood polish. And you're, you're, you're tasting that, you know, there's a lot of things about it that I, I really like, but there's also a lot of things about Fernet in, well, at least Fernet Bronx. It's really the only Fernet I've really ever had. But we'll just say Fernet that I'm like, no, it's, there's just so much about it. Like, I'm like, no, there's a reason I don't like it, but there's stuff I'm like, but I like it. Right. You know, it's like, it's so bad. It's good. It's not that it's bad, but when you're just kind of like, oh, I shouldn't like it, but I do. Right. And I can tell you the first time I had this, I found it in, I found it in the liquor cabinet. And I, I mean, I was of age and I want to say it was when I first moved back to San Antonio, I don't think it was before I left San Antonio. And that's why I think this might be the original bottle from, from then. And I remember having it and I was still getting into wine and I was like, Oh, this is horrid. And that was my first experience with it. It was kind of like my first experience with Pinot Noir. It wasn't that bad, but I still was like, Oh, Pinot Noir sucks. That's because I was a sucky Pinot Noir that I had. This is something where I kind of say it isn't a kind of an acquired taste. It was like this caramel, caramelized chocolate thing too. 
I mean, this thing is super complex. There's all kinds of stuff. I mean, I'm still tasting it because it's really, really potent. There's a lot of things I like about it because it brings back good memories of going into things like Pier 1, World Market, that and antique shops. And there's certain childhood things or young adult things about it that's like, it's really pleasant. Now that I'm sitting back and sipping on it and like, like I just kind of letting it be what it is instead of like, oh, I hold my nose and like do a shot of it. So, and compared to some of the Fernet Broncos I had, I wouldn't be surprised if this is like a more potent version of it. I don't think it, there's nothing on it that says there's anything different than what it normally says. But yeah, I mean, this thing is, it's potent. Now, is it working as the Digistief? I mean, my stomach was fine. So it wasn't like my stomach was like, I'm well buffed and I'm like, indigestion and all that or um as the italian americans say i can't remember i used it yesterday in my thing so as the digestif is it working well i don't feel stuffed i don't feel like buffad um so there's really nothing to settle. I'd also don't have agita, which is another Italian American slang to say you have indigestion or heartburn. And I don't feel like that, but I can kind of see how this will settle the stomach, but it's so powerful alcohol wise. It's kind of like, wow, I don't know, but you know, I'm not some 60 year old Italian American or Italian guy in a, you know, a, a tank top white tank top, you know, hanging out at the house at the kitchen table, you know, drinking. This is exactly what is done. This is not like necessarily, I mean, sophisticated people do it too, but your average person, this is what they drink. They drink Amaro's, whether it's a Fernet style Amaro or other Amaro's after dinner, this is what they do. They drink some of this or they drink really, you know, they drink espresso. Again, there's a huge bitterness component to it probably why Italians love espresso. And I can see where this goes with that. It's like, there's so much complexity in this thing. I mean, I really am appreciating what it is. And after tonight, I'm probably going to appreciate it more as far as not just aromas, but on the flavor. But only if I drink it this way. Otherwise, you don't really appreciate it. So that's going to do it for tonight's episode. I hope you like Life with Mark. It was fairly unscripted. I mean, I read, I, I, I took notes here and I tried to read the notes verbatim instead of like the, the teleprompter that I probably did episode one and the last couple episodes of Elite Wine. The next, whatever reviews I do, I will definitely have a script to get, set things up and then freestyle on the review itself. So I hope you really enjoyed this. I don't know how often I will do this type of thing where I'll sit down at the kitchen table and whatever we have for dinner, pair a wine with it or do it at a restaurant. Maybe next year, once we have a vaccine or we feel comfortable going to a restaurant, grant that I also have to have the restaurant give me permission to film and probably set up in an area where there's no one behind me and then get weird looks from the rest of the guests. But it's kind of fun to do. It's definitely a long episode. I have no idea how long the episode is going to be because I'm definitely going to cut some things out. But yeah, I hope you like it. Hope you're going to like the new show. Hope you like the new graphics, the new intro, how I'm doing things with, with uh, showing you pictures and Google Earth. And uh, yeah, we'll see everyone again next time.